Good afternoon. God speak. Hey, somebody here is prepared for a very fast getaway. You've left your car running. It's a blue Civic Honda uh, with license 5HBA639. So if that's a giveaway, like we're going to roll dice for it and give it to somebody, somebody might drunk, jump in and drive away. But just wanted you to know, just in case, maybe you, it's so hot you just wanted to be cool when you went out there in an hour and a half. Don't know. But we thought we'd give you a shot. Hey, if you need a Bible, raise your hand and our service team will get one to you. If you have your Bible, open to Romans chapter 5 for our message, Fresh Life. Do you need some fresh life? Paul the Apostle is sharing the incredible truths throughout this book. Years ago, as a young minister, I heard that if you read the book of Revel, or Romans, it will revolutionize your life. And then I read, if you, as a pastor, teach through the book of Romans, you'll revolutionize your church. So I took both at face value. First, I studied the book of Romans as a young Christian. And then years later, as a young pastor, I thought, I'm going to take our congregation through Romans, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. There's 16 chapters, and at the end of it, there is this incredible liberty and freedom that the message of God's truth so transforms your soul. I felt as if not only reading it, but later teaching it to the congregation, I personally enjoyed this experience by God's spirit of fresh life. And then the church experienced this fresh life. Because without the truth of God's word and God's spirit working through God's word to change you and I, we really don't have much life at all, do we? Even for a lot of Christians, brothers and sisters, people that would say, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. I'm a Christian. You have enough of Jesus to get to heaven but because you're not growing in your walk with the Lord and reading God's word and prayer and fellowship, you don't have enough of Jesus to bring heaven down to you. Because you see, the reality is, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. Once you receive Christ, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's presence, Jesus says in John 14, that the Father and I are going to come make our home inside of you. Now think about that for a moment. The creator of the universe, the Father, the Son, and is going to make that real by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is going to come live inside of this stinking sinful carcass redeemed by his grace. You see, the elevation of your walk in the Lord, as you sow to the Spirit, you reap from the Spirit. How is it that Christians that are saved can be going through life living a miserable life? This is how it works. Because you've received Christ, your eternity is assured that you're going to spend eternity with the Lord. But as you sow to the Spirit and you read the Word and you pray and you're in fellowship, what happens is you begin to fill up and the fruits of the Spirit begin to flow out of your life. So the quality of your life increases as you sow to the Spirit. Are you reading God's Word? Are you praying? Are you hanging out with fellowship with the Lord? And so then your love, your joy, your peace began to elevate you. We're like, man, I am enjoying my life in a way that I've never enjoyed. But then if you reduce those things, you're not in the word, you're not in prayer, and you're not in fellowship, what happens is that abundant life diminishes. You don't lose your salvation in either situation. You just either have a lot of abundant fruit by God's life and spirit, or it's reduced to you're limping along till one day you step into heaven. Alan Redpath, Pastor Craig's grandfather, who is a very famous British preacher, he was in accounting. He was a Christian, but he really wasn't, so, he really wasn't in the word and prayer that much. And he was sitting on the back row of church one day. He's a young guy. I think he was like, you know, in his late 20s, maybe early 30s. And for the first time, he heard a preacher say this phrase. Do you know it's possible to have a saved soul in a lost life? And it really struck him. All week long, he was thinking, saved soul, lost life. Because that's the way he felt. He had received Christ. He's going to heaven. 
But he wasn't really giving himself to spiritual things in the word and prayer so that he could elevate the quality of his life. The Bible says, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. If you sow to the Spirit, you're going to experience the fountain of everlasting life, or in our passage, for the sake of the title, fresh life from Lord. Or if you sow to the flesh, you reap the corruption. You just, you know, you're saved, you leave church on Sunday, and then you basically just go live like hell for the rest of the week. Or do, you, do you have a lot of quality of life flowing? I'm sorry to be so direct. I startled some of you. I can tell your visitors. Okay. Right? And then you think you're going to have a quality of life, right? But the quality of life comes literally from Jesus said, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. It's this union in relationship with the Lord, not once a week, but just in a daily way of talking to the Lord. You see, I talk to the Lord when I pray, and when I read his word, God's talking to me. That's what you call a relationship, right? Right? And the more I do that, the more filled up I am with a supernatural relationship that begins to spill over in my life. Paul the Apostle is going to mention eight things in these 11 verses that will bring fresh life to you. The knowledge of it, the understanding of it, but more than that, the experiential pressing in and leaning into these things. If you'll stand with me, we're going to read these 11 verses here in Romans chapter 5, part of our Anchored in the Word series. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Father, we ask now that by your spirit, you would communicate the truths of the incredible work, Lord Jesus, you have come to do in each one of our hearts. But I just want to pause in this prayer, thinking of all the men and women that have come in here, and some are yet to surrender their life to you, Jesus. Others have surrendered their life, but their life is eaten up by sowing to the flesh and just being consumed with life without really seeking you so that the abundant life is flowing. Lord, I pray that there might be inspiration by your spirit and through your word for fresh life for each one of our hearts that you're for us and you have come that we might have life and that more abundantly. But the devil, the thief, has come to steal and kill and destroy our lives. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Lord, give us spiritual eyes to realize we're in a spiritual battle and the weapons of our warfare are spiritual in nature and mighty in God to pull down the strongholds in our lives that the fresh life, the abundant life, the eternal life would flow to us now. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You see, the first step you have to understand, if you're going to release fresh life, if you're going to have abundant life flowing from you, it's going to be through faith. The only way to please God is not by your works, not by your actions, not by your efforts, not by your perspiration, but simply by believing his word that it's true. Isn't it fascinating? You know what pleases God? 
It says that I believe he exists. Do you believe that God exists? Give me a little head nod, okay? I believe God exists. Some of you are not quite sure. Hopefully the Lord will break through into your lives. But secondly, do you believe that he is a, rewards those who earnestly seek him? When I seek him, will I find him? If I seek him, will he allow me to have this relationship? If, if I seek him by faith, because you see, I got to believe that he is before I go looking for him, correct? So this is the, the, the posture that we move forward in, and in faith. And these are the things we want to glean in these eight thoughts that are in these 11 verses. The first is that faith, what will faith? What will faith bring to your soul? Faith will bring you peace. Some of you came here today filled with anxiety, filled with restlessness, filled with frustration. Life's kicking your butt. You're in difficulty with your relationship. You're having a hard time at work. Sometimes it's just our own internal mechanisms. There's no problem externally, all the problems inside of us. Do you have peace? Well, how do I tap into the fresh life of this peace? It says, therefore, in verse one, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, one of the things that robs me of peace is a sense of guilt and shame for my sin, right? I've done something wrong. And modern psychologists, secular psychologists, realize that people feel guilty, and so they try to remove the guilt. Like, where are you getting that pressure from external you know, forces? Who's the oppressor in your life? Is it the Christian message? Is it Christians in your life? Is it family? Who's the oppressor in your life? No, you know, sometimes I just stink and feel guilty because I'm guilty. You know that? Why do I feel guilty? Because I'm doing something wrong. Duh. But if I want to comfort myself, I can always find somebody that will bring some psychobabble to me that would just, you know, pat me on the back. It's okay. I know you've been acting like a total pig, but it's not your fault. And they just go from counselor to counselor to counselor to find somebody just going to comfort you, going to comfort you. Now sometimes, you see, the difference between conviction and condemnation, Jesus didn't come to condemn us. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin so that we'll repent and draw close to him. Conviction drew you here today. Condemnation left a bunch of people in front of their TVs at home today because they said, why should I go to church? I'm condemned. I've messed up. They've listened to the lie of the devil that condemns because condemnation will always drive you from the throne of love and grace. And the Bible says, the wicked has no peace, says the Lord. There's a deep rest and a deep tranquility in your soul that longs just to be at peace. Just to be at peace in your relationship with God. So he tells us through the act of faith that I trust what God has done for me, I'm justified by faith, which means I'm just as if I had never sinned. So when I come to Jesus by faith and I realize he took all of my judgment, all of his punishment, my punishment on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead, I realize my guilt, my shame is all placed on him. God has judged that. And since I'm now justified, just as if I've never sinned, by faith, right with God, Ah, I'm flooded with peace because it's not about my performance. It's about Jesus' performance and me believing in that finished work and performance. And so now I have a deep peace. If I woke up every day and went to sleep every night only having peace based on Rick Brown's performance, I am toast. I'm a guy that's never having peace. Because it's like, I could always do better. I shouldn't have had that thought. Why did I say that? You know what I mean? It's just like, I just go through my life, but if it's based on me being right with Jesus, I can wake up with peace. I can go to sleep with peace. And here this morning, this afternoon, before you, I am at total peace inside of me because Jesus has made a way for me to be right with God. This is the number one need I have is a deep sense that I'm right with God because after that, then I can start working on getting right with everybody else but I first have to get right with God. The first command is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, right? And then love your neighbor as yourself. So you have to get the vertical right before you get the horizontal right. Sometimes people are working on the horizontal. I'm like, hey, what about the vertical? Well, I don't know about God, blah, 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 blah. It's like, hey, you really can't get here unless you get there. 
You need to have that peace. So number one, this faith brings a peace through the justification work of the redemption of Jesus. Secondly, it brings us access in verse two by faith through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This faith gives me access. Now that I'm forgiven by the blood of Jesus, now I have access in talking to the Lord. I can come boldly into the heavenly places, spiritually speaking, by, with, with incredible faith, I have access. You know what it's like to fill on the outside of things? You're growing up in school, you always want to be on the in, but you're on the outs. <laughs> My sister, when we were, we were, uh, we were pull right trash when we grew up. I'm the youngest of four. We were living over here on Paramount Ranch, and there's the little house is still there by the road where we lived. It was only a two bedroom upstairs, but it was a family of six. So my stepdad put some sheetrock down the crawl space. You had to go into the bedroom like this, you know, and, and, and sleep underneath the crawl space. The door's about, you know, this, this tall. And uh, they put us in school over here at Thousand Oaks. So my sister, she's just hit that stride where it's really important as a girl, you know, look cute. She's like 12. She's going through puberty. She wants, you know, she's just a normal girl. But we're really poor. So we have to clean horse stalls every morning and then every night when we're done with school. Got to do the horse stalls. You know, before the fire, if you've ever been out to Paramount, before they, the barns and stuff, well, we, we mucked those stalls and uh, there was like 60 head of horses there. And my stepdad was a horse trainer. <clears throat> and so uh, my, my mom and stepdad thought it would be great to give my sister a pair of shoes that would work both ways at school and for muck and stalls. So they got her some yellow rubber boots. And that was her fashion statement when she went to school at Thousand Oaks. All the kids, like, all talking trash, making fun of her. My sister was so humiliated. And she just wanted to be accepted. She's the new girl, first of all. The new girl in the yellow rubber boots. No doubt has got horse manure over because we had to muck the stalls, then get on the bus and come. <laughs> she said, what was my lifeline? I just wanted to have a friend. And she says, some black sisters in the Lord, three girls, looked at her and looked at her boots and they were moved with compassion for this poor, dumpy, little white trash girl. And they became her friends. And she was accepted. She had access. Now every day, even though she kept wearing the little rubber boots, these girls accepted her and were kind to her and loved her and they became her friends. Now, all the, all the white girls wanted nothing to do with her. And here the black girls, they were showing the love. But you know, deep in your heart, just like deep in your heart, you want peace, you, you want rest for your soul and your relationship with God, you know what you also want? Is you want to be accepted. Every human is going through life longing to be accepted in love from their parents, from their siblings, from their classmates. And when people feel alienated from their parents, from their siblings, from the kids in school, and they just never, they never have access to relationship. We're social creatures, and there's this, this woundedness that seems to happen inside of us, this brokenness that seems to happen inside of us. And we begin, begin to get actually mentally unstable because you're not, you just, I mean, these people that usually show up and shoot up something, when you find out about their life, they're usually these anti-social people that were never accepted, they were never brought in, to community, because that's what people long for. To, to long for acceptance and love for who you are. You don't have to play any games, this is who I am, and I wanna be accepted. So you can understand we're only two into eight things, and so there's fresh life that comes to me when I experience supernatural peace. The peace that comes from God, it surpasses or it guards our hearts and our minds, which is our emotions, our hearts and our minds, our thought life, a supernatural peace from God. 
but then a supernatural acceptance with God because once God has accepted me, then I have this ability to relax. And what, now, whether people accept me or not, I'm okay with because I'm already accepted by God. I have access to God. So now I have a greater confidence to move through life. Thirdly, this faith brings hope in verse 3 and 4. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. These four steps, if you will, notice that even though you have peace and you have access to God, you can still go through a lot of garbage in life. Any of you going through it? Just wait a week. You will be going through it. Right? That's life. It's like, you don't, it's like storm systems that just roll through, right? Here comes the clouds. Here comes the rain. Here comes the wind. You think it's never going to be over and then it's over. You go, oh, I got a day of sunshine. Here comes the next storm. These things are good for us, but I would not have hope, which it's leading me to the, the doorstep of hope for you to have understanding. You know what hope is? Hope is the certainty. It's not, on the streets, we say, well, I hope so. I hope it works out. It's kind of this flippant, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But biblical hope has a different definition. Biblical hope is the certainty of coming good from a loving father in heaven to me as child, no matter the adversity I'm going through. And that hope carries me through. It has been said that man can live 40 days without food. He can live 10 days without water. He can live four minutes without oxygen. And he can't live one moment without hope. Because as soon as you absolutely lose hope and despair, then you say, I'm going to take my life. Because all the hope's gone. There may be somebody right here, right now this afternoon. You came in. As your last cry for the hope before you go in your life tonight. I've seen it over and over through the years. It's been bizarre, the people that I've been in contact and other ministers have been in contact, people that said, you know, well, I guess I'll give, I'll give the Lord one more shot. They go to church and the gun's in their trunk or the pills or whatever, and they're just gonna go from church and then they're gonna go in their life. We had a gal come to my wife's Christmas two years ago on a Saturday, and her husband, he was the most, it was a small community, and he was the most well-known prestigious plastic surgeon in our community. He left her and her two boys for his nurse that worked in the office. She's devastated. But she was so devastated and the boys were so devastated, she said in her heart, I'm gonna go to this Christmas tea, I'm gonna come home, and I'm gonna kill both my boys, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my life. She came to that Christmas tea. She's just like, well, what do I got to lose? Right? This is it. It's over. I'm taking my life and killing my boys too. And Jesus threw out his lifeline of love and acceptance and hope and forgiveness and redemption. <laughs> that was almost 30 years ago. I was just at her boy's wedding 30 years later. He's one of my son's best friends, has been all these years. And there he was, stepping into marriage with the love of his life, and just seeing the glow on his face and realizing that this moment almost never happened 30 years ago. Because she had lost hope. You see, the trials, what does it do trials? This is what Paul says, we know this. Now, some of us don't know this, so I want you to know. Paul acts like you know this, but I know some of you don't know this. All right? And this is what we know. He says, we glory in tribulation. I've been walking with Jesus almost 40 years, and I am not quite there yet. Like when hard things, I'm like, glory, this is so awesome. Now, I'm, not, I'm like, okay, Lord, I know you're going to use this. And how's he going to use it in my life in the tribulation? It's going to produce perseverance. It gives me the ability to go through hard things. Right? That's what, when you go through tribulations, your character is forged by not giving up, but pressing ahead by faith through your adversities and through that perseverance, that perseverance produces character in you, right? You begin to develop character. 
which has a stability through hard things. And then that character produces the hope. You see the beauty of walking with Jesus for 40 years, and I can look back and say, God brought me through that, and God brought me through that, and God brought me through that, and God brought me through that. And if you've only been a Christian here for eight months, you're like, I don't know that Jesus is going to get me through this. And I look at him and say, oh, most certainly, a lot of times, young couples, right? They're just married. They get married, they're a year, and they're like, what do I do? I, I, I don't know what I do. I think it shows that this is terrible. This is off. This is hard. Like, they're just so traumatized, uh, just simply by marriage. <laughs> oh, we're going to make it through this. And, and I'm like, do you both love Jesus? Oh, we love Jesus. We could, we're not sure with each other anymore, but <laughs> we both really love Jesus. And, and I just simply say, with absolute confidence, I said, you're going to make it. And they look at me like it's a prophetic word. How do you know? How do you know we're going to make it? And I said, because you both just told me you love Jesus and the good work that he began in you, he's going to bring it to completion. And God's been bringing me through hard things in every area of life, marriage and kids and family. I mean, these are hard things. And you come through, and every time you get through a really difficult spot, at the end of it, you know what? You're stronger, right? You're stronger. It's like going to the gym. You got to go to the gym, hurt your muscles, and get sore for them to grow. Isn't that weird? We pay to do that. I got a gym membership. I'm going to pay to go hurt myself. Like, seems so ridiculous. But I realize if I don't do that, what happens is atrophy. Your muscles atrophy and your bone density atrophies when you simply don't do that. And so spiritually, you have spiritual atrophy. Faith is a muscle that you have to use through the adversity of life. But what do we do? When we're going through adversities, rather than pressing in and trusting God... We self-medicate and tune out. It's usually in the form of some bottle, right? It's in a bottle. It's in a bag. It's in a joint. Oh, now they got chewables. And now it's, you know, like you can go through the list. It's prescription. How, how, do, I, how do I escape this pain in a six-pack? Rather than say, Lord, I, I want to trust you. I'm going I'm to go through this adversity. And as I go through it, on the other side of it, I am going to be, I'm going to, you're going to fill me with hope. You see, these three steps alone, when you have peace with God, and you have access to God during these hardships and difficulties, and then you're filled with hope that God can bring you through hard stuff and develop your character, but this brings love. Faith brings love in verse 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. As I'm laying hold of hope, faith, hope, and love are the three great Christian qualities, Paul the Apostle said, and the greatest is love. So faith is I'm trusting God to do the impossible. Hope is I'm certain he's going to do cool things. And then love is the overflow of being able to be full of God's love so that I can treat you the way I'm supposed to. Love is patient. Love is kind, right? It doesn't parade itself. Love does not seek its own. It's not my own agenda. Because as soon as I start going through tribulations, what happens to you when you're going through a hard time? You're biting everybody's head off. Snap, 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 snap. And then afterwards, rather than saying, hey, I'm sorry for being a total jerk, you say, I'm sorry I spoke like that, but I'm really going through. And then you describe, it's, it, it's really not an apology. You know what I mean? It's really not an apology. It's like, I'm a jerk. I have hard things. That means I get the opportunity to dump all my garbage on you. And if I can't do it to you, I'm going to kick the dog. But I got to find somebody down the food chain to be able to. But love, as you're going through this stuff, love is like, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not an emotion. There can be emotions that accompany love. But this is the mistake that the Americanized version of Christianity has, is that love is an emotion. No, I can love you. You can be a total stranger. I don't know you. You might even be really awkward, or you look at me and you think, hey, you're a very socially awkward person. But I can be patient and kind with you. I can be interested in you and what's going on with you rather than being self-absorbed by myself. And I'm not going to, love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. Meaning that if you're living in sin, 
Love is not putting up with that. No, love is speaking the truth in love. Like, hey, you're in sin. You're a Christian. You should get out of sin. You should repent. You should get right with God. That's also loving. None of these things have to do with emotions. But I need this to fill me up because it's the opposite of who I am without Jesus. How about you? I am the biggest fan of Rick Brown. Meaning, all of us are. And I've shared with you guys over and over. Like, you are consumed with yourself. You think about yourself. You're having a pity party for yourself. So, well, well, nobody, nobody's thinking about me. Well, you're thinking about yourself enough for the entire world. <laughs> right? You're absolutely consumed. All you think of is me and my and my. It's, just, it's all about me. And you, I mean, your mind gets off. You have to go do something. And then it comes back. And now it's all about me. That's why the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. It's not saying i got to figure out how to love myself. I love myself. When I'm hungry, it's strange. I just feed me. When I'm cold, I get warm. When I'm hot, I get cool. If I'm thirsty, I get some water. No matter what I do, it's amazing how well I take care of myself. Right? I'm well fed. I'm looked after. You know, I just, I just take care of myself. And the Lord says, now, Rick, you know that kind of concern you have for yourself? Why don't you treat others that way? You say, what? You mean care about other people? Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they're thirsty. Maybe, maybe they need somebody to talk to. Maybe they need somebody to pray with. Maybe they need some help. Yeah. Why don't you start thinking about them? It's weird. When I got radically saved at the age of 19, and then I had my first Christmas. I'd never, our Christmas, you'd have to know our house, but our, our house was the, we had a huge, every year, a huge Christmas Eve party at my house, which was a total drunken drug blitz. I mean, it was just like, hey, Christmas Eve, I'm in our place, this is what's going to happen. And then I got saved. And it was the first time I went towards Christmas. And I asked, I was, wow, Jesus, Jesus came into the world for me. And then I started thinking to myself, because I, I never got presents for anybody, ever, ever. I never bought presents for anybody. All, I mean, I'm 19 years old. I never bought presents. And I knew what, you know, my mom was giving. When you grow up poor, I know what the presents are under the tree for birthdays and Christmas. It's going to be, well, Christmas is two pairs of Wranglers, a new package of socks, a new package of underwear, maybe two shirts. It's like the necessities. There's not, because you're, you're poor, you just get the necessities. It was, a, it was weird, but for the first time in my heart, and my God filling me with the Holy Spirit, shedding his love abroad inside of me, I'm like, man, I want, I want to get a present from my mom. I want to get a present from, from my brother. It's so funny because when you're first saved, right, you're not very long out of the world. So you know what I got my brother? My brother was a Copenhagen chewing machine. So I got him a huge sleeve of Copenhagen cans. That's like, you know, a pack of 10 and then a big brass spittoon. <laughs> because he would spit in every Coca-Cola can in the house. And every now and then you grabbed you. You thought it was your Coke. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can still remember that moment, right? I'm like, use this spittoon. He never did use the spittoon. But, but honestly, it, it, it seems weird. It seems almost uh, ludicrous. But for me, those baby steps, I, it was the first time I opened my eyes and said, hey, you know, I wonder if I could help somebody else. I wonder if I could be a blessing. I was startled as I looked back in my rearview mirror and saw how absolutely self-centered and consumed I was. Shortly after that, I looked in my album, my senior you know, album and all, all friends and people you, you went to school with for years wrote in your album. And I had never really paid attention for the first time. I said, and I really, wonder what? And I read this one quote that was from this girl that I had went from like seventh grade all the way through 12th grade. We're in the same grade. And she said, Rick, for a guy that is nice sometimes, you have no idea how you cruise through life hurting everybody around you. That's what she put in my album, my senior album. I'm like, wow, I should have read this a long time ago. Right? Is this me? If you're sitting here today, you, you might not have been me, but you're totally consumed with yourself. And it's destroying your marriage. It's all about you. The Bible says we're... Wherever there is selfish ambition, there is every evil thing. That means when I want my way, 
it opens the door for all kinds of evil to move in. I need to be delivered from myself and be filled with God's love because as my, my wife and I were, we were, you know, maybe we we're Christians 10 years and we we're ministering to this young couple and they were just married and we're talking and the, the, the girl in this couple, Tammy's sitting there with me, and the girl, she kept going on and on about how amazing I was. I thought it was pretty cool, right? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, but Rick, you know, he, he's, he's not like Rick and Rick does this and Rick does that. And she, you know, after a little while, my wife was like, She knows, and, and finally, my wife, she, she just kind of snapped. She said, hey, and kind of startled all, all of us. And she said, hey, without Jesus, Rick is an absolute jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, thanks, honey. That was just so good. I needed to hear that. <laughs> because you see, she knew me before I was a Christian. She knew how I acted. She saw me after, so she knew B.C., in 80. <laughs> she knows both. So there's no pulling the wool over her eyes. But honestly, some of us are just, you, you think you've got all these problems and they're all out here. It's with your boss and it's with this family member and it's with this. But the one consistent thing in all those conflicts you're having is the person looking at you in the mirror every single morning. It's because you have an expectation of what these people should be doing and they're not. You know what an expectation is? It's a premeditated resentment. As soon as you put an expectation on somebody and they don't fulfill your expectation, you're resentful. Who asked you to put that expectation on them? That's why all these young couples I used to do premarital and then marital counseling with, they've been married for two years, and I kept trying to tell them, lower your expectation, man. You think, <laughs> you think it's you know, a glass of wine on a bearskin rug in front of the fireplace every night? I mean, you're married to construction worker Bubba. It's not happening. Never happening. Right? And so there's this big disconnect like this. The key to love flowing is understanding. Understanding is the key to love to flow to other people, even hurting people, broken people. So we got to move along. I'm taking too long. And here. So verse 6, faith brings strength. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Before you have Jesus, I don't care how physically strong you are, how psychologically strong you are, how emotionally strong you think you are, you have no strength without Christ. In comparison to the strength that a supernatural God will fill you with, that kind of strength is what you need. You don't need your own pull myself up by my own bootstraps type of strength. You need to learn this key, and it's at the end of Paul the Apostle's life that he says it, so we know he learned it in the process, but if he hadn't told us, we wouldn't even believe it. He said, I've learned this, that when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, how's that? Well, you see, I have to pour out a glass so it's totally empty if I'm going to fill it up with God. It's like you are this glass and you've got to be poured out from yourself. It's like this, the Lord diminishes you to the place that you finally go, okay, Lord, uncle, I can't handle this. It's so strange that how often and repeatedly I have to learn this lesson throughout these 40 years of walking with the Lord. I'm trying to do it on my own. I'm trying to do it on my own. I fail miserably over and over and over. And then I finally come to the end of myself. And I'm like, Lord, help me. I can't, ha I can't do it. He's like, well, I was just waiting for you. I was, just, I was just waiting for you to finally get there. This last week, I was with my wife and uh, daughter and her husband and my two grandchildren. And it's like this deja vu thing, right? Here's my daughter, and she's trying to teach my four-year-old granddaughter how to tie her shoes. Well, my daughter's 31, and when she was four, I taught her how to tie her shoes. Right? So we're having, I'm, I'm looking at my daughter, and you know when you're, you're teaching your kids. I taught both my children how to tie shoes, their shoes. It's like you act like it's a little game. Well, you take this, and the rabbit goes underneath the, you know, the, through the brush, and then the rabbit's ears, and you, you, like, you do this little game with it so that they remember. But the exact same thing was happening with my four-year-old granddaughter. My daughter tried to show her once, and she says, I got it, I got it, I can do it. And then she tried, and she absolutely couldn't do it. And then my daughter tried to help her. No, 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 I got, I got it, I got it. And I'm just like, 
Like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? <laughs> and that's the way we go through our Christian life. I can handle this. I can handle this. Fail, fail, fail. I can handle this. I can handle Fail, fail, fail. And you finally go, God, I can't do this. My son, because he was the first one that I taught to tie his shoes, it wasn't, I, I stepped back and I just realized what was going on because he was getting frustrated and I started getting frustrated. This is my first attempt at trying to teach one of my children to tie shoes. And I stepped back and I said, son, you know what? Why don't you knock yourself out and if you can get it, I'm going to rejoice with you. But if you finally figure out you don't how to know how to do it and you're willing to ask me, I'm just here to help. And it finally kind of relaxed things. He tried for a little while and he finally goes, okay, dad. I can't do it. Help me. Maybe there's something going on in your life right now. You've been repeating this terrible cycle. You know the definition of insanity. <laughs> Doing the same thing and hoping for different results. <laughs> you finally get to the place you go like, God, I can't do this. You will discover the greatest power in your life when you confess that in your weakness, you know that God will pour in his power. I'm getting ready to step up here today. I've been doing this for 35 years. I'm back there being entertained by Garrett, who's a lot of fun, right? And I'm back there, and once again, I'm like, Lord, you know, I have nothing fruitful to say here to these precious people. I'm weak, I'm helpless, I'm just a man, but I would really love your word to come to life to touch their hearts because that's what you desire. And if that pleases you in my weakness, confessing my weakness, to fill me with your strength and your power, to be a blessing to others, that's really all, what I'm here to do today. Yeah, so, amen. So it's not like you reach a place and you go, like, no, I'm strong. It, it never happens. Never reach that place. The more you lean into your weakness, the more you realize, ladies, you can't love that guy the way God wants you to. You just can't. That's a supernatural thing. All right, some of us guys specifically are harder to love than other guys, as my precious wife can attest. And vice versa. Guys, you, you just, you really can't be the man that God wants you to be in that relationship without his strength. And it's not until you confess that and say, you know what? I'm a self-centered jerk. I'm weak. I, I don't know how to do this. God, please teach me how to love her. She's fearfully and wonderfully made. She's unique. The things that will bless her heart. It's not some stereotype. It's just like she's very unique. Help me love her. Years ago, our marriage changed in a certain season. And I could tell, like, just something happened. This is many years ago. We were young Christians. And I looked at my wife and I said, What's happened? She goes, what do you mean? I said, you know what I mean, something's different. Like it's, she says, well, is it different good? Is it different bad? And I said, no, it's, I mean, I'm blown away. It's like, it's amazing what's going on. And she said, well, for the last three weeks, I've been praying every morning I wake up, Lord, I tried to do this on my own, knowing how to love Rick, and I, I just don't know how to do it. So Lord, I'm gonna pray every day for these coming weeks to see what you do, help me, be the wife that Rick needs. And it transformed our marriage. And I was so inspired, I asked her to forgive me for not praying in such a similar way, and I started praying, Lord, help me be the husband that Tammy needs. But that only happens when two people realize that they don't have the strength to do it on their own. Right? It's dependence. This is what pleases God. It pleases God when you trust him by faith and you earnestly seek him for his help and he comes through because when it happens, I want you to know I'm here today to tell you that Jesus is the hero of the story. Not me. <laughs> not my wife. Jesus is the hero of the story. Faith also brings sacrifice in verse 7 and 8. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love motivated Jesus to bring sacrifice for us. And he demonstrates his love. Because I can tell you I love you all day long, but it's just words, right? I have to demonstrate that love. I have to show that love. I have to... It's not enough to somehow be, you know, write a poem, you have to demonstrate love. Jesus it gave the ultimate demonstration because the Bible says greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Think about it. Who would you even dare to lay your life down for? Most people on one hand are the people you would die for. 
right? You die for a sibling, you die for your mom or your dad or your, your wife or your kids, whatever. I mean, there's a handful of people you would literally die for. I don't care what you say with your bravado and your big talk. I mean, no, when it comes down to it and push comes to shove, you're going to take a bullet for them or you're going to lay your life down for them. There's only a couple people in your life that you would do that for. And yet Jesus says, but I did it for you. He says, well, eat. They would have to be a good person for you to want to do it, right? Now, if Adolf Hitler is going to die and you know what he's done, are you going to give your life for Adolf? No, right? Because he's not a good man. Now, somebody's really good and they might dare to die for them, lay their life down. But the Lord puts us all in the same category. He goes, why you are a sinful person in rebellion against me, I died for you. I died for you when you were a total dumpster fire. You were a total mess, hot mess. I died for you. You didn't have your act together. It's not like, oh, there's a nice one. I think I'll die for them. (laughs) It's not the way it worked. It's like, here's this incredible humanity. And Jesus died for us. It brought the sacrifice. It also inspires us that we want to lay our life down for other people. Because he did it for us. Are you just blown away? I think good sinners have a harder time with this than bad sinners. I'm a bad sinner, so the Bible says those who are, uh, you know, forgiven much, love much. So I'm like crazy in love with Jesus for what he's done for me because I've been, you know, I came from such a, a terrible place and such wickedness. But I think sometimes, you know, uh, so I'm overwhelmed that God would even love me. Well, yet I was yet a sinner. But does it really blow your mind? Maybe you weren't that... You know, bad sinner, you're just, you're an honor roll student, you pay your taxes, you do all the nice stuff, you know, you got the bumper stickers talking about it. Uh, and, and sometimes for you, there's this disconnect from the level. Do, do you realize in the right circumstance you are capable of anything? Do you understand that? You're, do you realize that your capacity for evil in this room, in your own DNA, at the right time, at the right place, in the right circumstance, you would do unspeakable things. But a lot of times people don't really know themselves and they don't know what human history says. The Bible says, the Lord tells the children of Israel that, hey, I'm gonna, when you guys are out of line, I'm gonna bring discipline and the discipline is gonna be other nations. And so the city... The cities are going to be under siege, and you're actually going to eat your own children. It says the woman that's the most delicate is going to, because they're starving to death. When you're starving to death, you're going to eat your own kid. Now, what woman in here thinks you would actually do that? Absolutely none of you, right? Until you're starving to death. And then he says, then you'll actually fight over the placenta, right? You're going to eat the placenta. You're like, it's so horrendous. It's almost hard to like even process, right? Just <laughs> I was at the historic Donner Pass. You know the story of Donner Pass. The people get caught in their wagon train in an early snow, and they start eating each other. So the first time we went over the Donner Pass, my kids are small. They're like, you know, nine and six. And I'm telling them this story, and they start eating each other. My kids went, what? And I said, I want you to know, if this ever happens and we're caught in a snowstorm, and you're going to eat somebody. I'm the largest, and I will have the most food on my body, so eat my body. And my kids were like, Dad, you're trying. <laughs> like, but I was try- trying to shock them and startle them with the reality, even when we talked for the next hour, because it's a road trip, right? They're like, there's no way I'd do I was like, you have no idea in the right circumstance what you would do. This demonstration of what God has done in our lives knows who we are, and yet he chose to die for you and to die for me. And so you think, well, my life's, I can't believe that God would forgive me now because you've been into a lot of stuff that nobody even in the room knows about. 
God knows, and he loves you, and he still wants to redeem you, and he still wants to forgive you, and he wants to transform you, and he wants to change you. He never gives up on you. The good work that he begun in you, he wants to bring it to completion. It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. That's why you're here today, because his goodness just keeps pulling on you. The Lord knows our frame that we are dust. It's not like he looks at us and... We're always so startled by ourselves. You ever fail badly? Like, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. God, can you believe this? Yeah, I can believe it. Totally believe it. Just been <laughs> believing it about humanity for the last 6,000 years. Yep, that's you. And that's, that's what people do. He's just like, the man after God's own heart, David, could, I can't believe that I committed adultery what if with my, one of my mighty men, Uriah. And then I had him killed and murdered. Oh, then I acted like the hero and married her. And then the baby died. Oh, I can't believe I've done this. God, did I shock you? No. I'll forgive you, but I want you to repent and come to me. See, the Lord wants truth in the inward part. So you have to start in that place of really coming into an openness and confession. Faith continues on to bring salvation. In verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We've been justified, justification, as if you're totally righteous. It's not just a not guilty, it's a righteous verdict because of what Jesus has done through shedding his blood. But it says we will be saved from wrath. What's wrath? Does it sounds pretty ominous? The wrath of God sounds pretty ominous. Do you know what Romans chapter one says God's wrath is? It's like when you're just totally bent on doing your own thing. God says, it says he gives you over to it. He goes, okay, you want that lifestyle? You want it? Go for it. Okay. That's wrath. Because until then, God's been tugging on me, pulling on me. God's, you know, he's convicted. He's wanting to bring me close to himself. He's kind of, and then finally the Lord goes, okay. You want that? You can have that. And wrath on planet Earth is God just taking his hand off of your life, letting you totally implode into the abyss of your own perversity. And he says, that's wrath all by itself. The consequences of that. In the future, we think of a wrath of God in hell. And there is a place called hell. And it is wrath. But wrath starts right here when he just hands you over to your lifestyle of sin. Because you just simply won't repent. You just simply don't want to do the right thing. You know what the right thing is. Somebody doesn't have to convince you of it. I learned this in counseling many years. People would come in and go, I got this really problem. And I'd say, well, really, tell me about your problem. They'll tell me the whole problem. And then I'll say, tell me what the solution is. And they tell me what the solution is. <laughs> they already know. The Holy Spirit's already told them. I'm like, well... You probably should do that. That's a good Bible verse. You should go with that. So I'm just a listener. Because they already know the right thing to do. They just have been refusing to do it. But he saves us by his blood and then his resurrection that we shall be saved by his life. Now he's going to live his life through us. And last and finally, faith brings joy. All these things should bring joy. I have peace with God. I have access to God. I'm filled with the hope of God. I'm filled with the love of God. I have the strength of God. I have the sacrifice of Jesus' love. I have this incredible salvation that I'm saved from something to be a useful instrument for him. And then it says in verse 11, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Why am I filled with joy? Because I'm reconciled to God. The word reconciled means to bring a friendly relationship and harmonious relationship where there's been hostility and enmity. Because before you come to God, you're an enemy of God. You're at enmity with God. You don't want to hear his word. It's like when my family, I had Christians that were family, they would want to invite me to church. I hated church with a passion. Like, oh, just shoot me in the head. I go to this church, and the people that took me have all, I mean, it's like 30 people with all gray hair, and they sing these really old songs, and they put me to sleep. And if they're not putting me to sleep, they have this fiery preacher that's terrifying me about the very fires of hell. And I'm five and six years old. I'm traumatized. PTSD about church. So if you ask me at 12, 13, 16, 17, church, I'm like, ha, 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 I don't want church. I don't want anything to do with it. I was at enmity. 
I didn't want to hear God's word. I didn't want to hang out with God's people. I did not want to go to his house. I did not want to worship God. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I literally, I just thought, all Christians that I've ever met are absolute dorks. Right, they're just total full-blown dorks. I had the, just the stinkiest attitude about anybody that was Christians. I'd be going along and talking to somebody, and as soon as they had mentioned they were a Christian, I would just find the exit door and get away from them. Why? Was I a friend of God? No. Did I have harmony with God? No. Was I an enemy of God? Yes. You go, well, I wasn't quite that bad. I'm, I'm sitting here today, and I'm kind of not, I'm like Switzerland. I'm kind of noncommittal. You know, I'm on the fence. I'm listening to you about this Jesus thing, and I'm looking at all the pleasure of the world and sin, and I'm just sitting here on the fence. I'm not for him. I'm not against him. Here I am, Mr. Spiritual Switzerland. <laughs> Neutrality in the spiritual realm. But the Word of God takes away your neutrality. Jesus said, you are for me or against me. You are either gathering people for the kingdom or you are scattering them. To be undecided is to be decided. You have decided. You're undecided. You're against him. And even the very fence you're sitting on, the devil owns the fence that you're sitting on. And you think you're Mr. Neutrality. You are totally delusional. You've already made your decision, and anyway, at this moment. So there's no place of neutrality because an enemy, you're either an enemy with God or you have a harmonious friendship with God. And when you're friends with God, it produces, I rejoice. There's a joy in my heart because I'm right with God. The rest of life, like the wheels can come off, and it's like, well, at least I'm walking with God. At least they can't take God away from me, right? No matter what they do, I, I got this incredible relationship with God. It's this mind-blowing thing. But in the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, one of those great heroic stories where there's civil disobedience by three godly individuals because they are demanded when the music plays, you must bow down to this 90-foot idol of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has built in his own image so that you worship it. And the three of them are like, no way. We're not, we only worship God. First and great commandment. Have no other gods before him. We're not doing it. And he goes, no, I don't think you heard me. He calls him in personally. Is this true? I'm going to play the music. You got another chop. I'm going to play the music. You had... What are you going to do? They said, oh, king, the God we serve is able to deliver us from you and your fiery furnace. Because whoever didn't bow down, we're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And so they said, our God's able to deliver us from this. But even if he doesn't, I guess we're going to be cremated. <laughs> And we're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. I guess we'll have ashes. So that's our choice. So he was so torqued off. He had the furnace heated seven times hotter. He had them all bound up. And the soldiers went and threw them in the furnace. And the fire was so hot, the soldiers that threw them in died of the heat. The soldiers. But they, all of their ropes come off. And Nebuchadnezzar takes a second look. And they're walking around in there. They're free. They're in the fire. <laughs> I love the Bible, like these supernatural things. It's kind of, you know, walking around in fire and, and Joshua in the battle. Joshua says, Lord, we need to kick their butts. Loose paraphrase. You got to get that in the Hebrew. So please make the sun stand still. And so it stands still for another 24 hours. That's, that's what I, I mean, some bold prayers, supernatural stuff. If you got a problem with supernatural things, you're going to have a very difficult time with the Bible. But those three guys were walking around and Nebuchadnezzar looks in the fire, but there's four of them. He goes, hey, you guys, didn't I throw in three? And they said, yes, sir, you threw in three. He goes, but this fourth one looks like the Son of God. This is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus showing up and joining these three brothers in the Lord that are following him. They would not bow. Jesus is like, yeah, I'll come into the fire with you. Now, isn't it weird that they were free? Because the first thing I would think if I'm walking around in the fire is if I'm free, the first thing I'm, I'm jumping out of the fire. But you know, they didn't get out of the fire. Why? Because they're hanging out with Jesus in the fire. They would rather be in the fire having fellowship in the trial with the intimacy they had with God. You ever have that in your life? You're going through such a trial, but the intimacy with Jesus was so rich, you almost miss it. You don't miss the trial, but you miss the intimacy that Jesus was with you as you're crying yourself to sleep at night. 
And so Nebuchadnezzar finally had to say, hey, hey guys, huh? he invites them, hey, come on out. <laughs> so they come out and he writes a decree that everybody should bow to this God because he's the God of gods, the king of kings. You see, when you're in relationship with God, the dynamics of your life, we call it transcendent. Don't you want to live a transcendent life? Here's your normal humdrum life. Some of you are living the most boring experience on planet Earth because there's very little faith going on. And you're just going along, this life is just, you know, my daughter called me when she was 18. She got married. She said after six months of work, she said, Dad, did you know that people just go to work for 40 hours a week, eat, sleep, and pay their bills, and that's their entire life? I said, yeah, that's what we call adulthood, honey. That's what we do. She's so shocked at the mundaneness of life. But transcendent is when I seek the Lord, and actually, even though my life circumstances don't change, I actually begin to transcend because I have this hope, and I have this love, and I have this joy, and I have this peace, and I have this access, and I just have this, this strength. I have this new relationship, and everybody around you is just in the grind. And here you are elevated through things that are invisible. They're invisible. Love, joy, and peace are invisible. It's not tangible. Can you go buy a six-pack out of their store? People try. It doesn't work, right? It's directly, your quality of life is directly corresponds to your daily intimacy with Jesus. And if you have a low quality of life, amen. If you, when we have a low quality of life, it's just because I'm just not waking up in the morning. And it's not complicated, you guys. Don't think, well, oh, that sounds really spiritual. I just wake up in the morning and go, hey, Jesus, I'm your servant today. Whatever you got going on, I'm into it. I mean, it's just very relaxed. I just talk to him like I talk to you. Read a chapter in the Bible, eat my Cheerios, go about my day. God brings people into my life, and I love on them and minister to them. I'm like, wow, that was crazy, these people coming into my life. But that's cool. I can share Jesus' love. And then I do it all over the next day. As long as you're just loving God and making yourself available, it's not complicated. So may God give you and I some fresh life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. We need your fresh life. We need your abundant life. And Lord, truly, uh, we have looked for it in all the wrong places. We've chased after money and fame and accolades and rewards and oh, whatever. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Thinking every time that we are going to end up at this place, that we're finally going to be happy. We're finally going to be satisfied. Only every single time to come up empty. So, Lord, we come to you. And the reality is that when we seek you, we never come up empty. You start filling us with your love, your joy, and your peace. And I just pray for my brothers and sisters here that you would help all of us in that very relational, laid-back way to talk to you daily, read your word, and have you lead and guide and direct our lives and fill us with your love and your faith and your hope. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.